Well, it's sure an honor to be here. I, first of all, Dr. Sanders, congratulations to you and your team. You know, this is the first time that you've done this, and I'm, I suspect this is going to continue to grow every year. It's, it's probably one of the most important things we can teach our fellow business leaders and, and uh, or we can do for our fellow business leaders and then to teach to our next generation is to uh, is to teach them how to expose themselves to good to good practices and leadership which they're exposed to I was just talking to some of our own my own colleagues from Mountain States Health Alliance and we were talking about teenagers kids in high school and how do you teach them how do you get them to be exposed to the types of things you're talking about here today and you know, of course, in high school, it's different. And of course, my advice to, to young kids in high school is the best way to learn leadership is to get involved outside the classroom, get involved in sports. The number one best way to do it is to be part of a team and learn what it's like to put others' needs before your own. And when you get, when you get to where that becomes natural, you become naturally a leader. Um, the, the most important thing I'm going to be doing today is, is introducing General Harrell uh, in a minute. Uh, but before I do that, I, I wanted to say a few things about Mountain States Health Alliance. You know, we, we're, we're more than just a collection of 14 hospitals and surgery centers and doctor's offices and, and that. We are, we're a major health system, but more importantly, what we are is a reflection of this community. Um, we're a, a not-for-profit organization that's governed by people who live here, who grew up here, uh, who care deeply about the health and, 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 and the health of this community and the, uh, the future and the vibrancy of the economy of this community. And so we're your partner. Mount States Health Alliance is a partner here. Um, we're going to be here for a long time to come. And we hope that you'll, you'll continue to rely on us, not just when you have a health care need, but when you look for opportunities to help grow our economy. We want to be a part of that as well. Um, I remember a story from a long time ago I met, and I've told this before. Some of you may have heard it. Um, I have a, a, I had the opportunity once to hear, how many of you saw the movie Apollo 13? Uh, remember Gene Krantz at Mission Control and you know we had three astronauts up in orbit and on their way to the moon and a horrible malfunction and Gene Krantz was the, he was played by Ed Harris in the movie who did a phenomenal job by the way if you've ever met the real Gene Krantz, um, you know he just did a great job reflecting who he is and his, his personality but you could tell from him that, that from the real Gene Krantz that this man was a natural leader. He was somebody who was faced with a very difficult challenge that would have been easy to say, this is too big for us to overcome. Um, instead, he said, we, we, we can't fail. We, we have to succeed in solving this problem. And if you remember his words, failure is not an option. And of course, proceeded then famously to bring back, it was the most uh, successful failure in the United States uh, 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 NASA program's history. Um, but one of the lessons I learned from Gene Krantz, he told this story, I had the chance to meet him, and he, he told the story of this young soldier that wanted to go do battle for his leader. And the leader said, you know, you're too young, you're immature, you're not prepared for this. And the young man said, uh, but I am please let me go. And so the, the leader said, okay. He gave him a horse, a shining armor, and a sword and sent him on his way. And about two weeks went by. Of course, the, the, uh, the commander said, I'll never see that young man again. Um, of course, the young man came back about a month later and, and said, uh, Sir, I, I want you to know, he, he pulled in, the horse was limping, the shining armor was dented and beaten up, and the sword was cut in half, and he just looked awful. This kid looked like he had been beaten to a pulp. He comes off his horse, he, he hobbles over to the, to the leader, and he says, Sir, I want you to know I have defeated our enemies to the east. And the guy says, But son, we don't have any enemies to the east. And the young man looked up at him, he said, Well, sir... We do now, and uh, you know, but you know the thing. The thing I most admire about great leaders is they're willing to take some risk. They're willing to they're willing to make the tough decisions. They're willing to take the risk of of making the decision, and then they're willing to own those decisions. You know, at Mount States Health Alliance, we're going through that right now. You see, in, in, throughout the region, you've read the news about the proposed merger between Mount States Health Alliance and, and Wellmont. And I have to tell you, you know, when putting together the proposal to make this, uh, to make this merger happen, it was high risk for us and for Wellmont. Um, but we decided it was the right thing to do. 
and, and we were prepared to stand up and take the questions and make the difficult call because we felt that 20 years from now, people will look back at this time and say, that was when that was decided. That, 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 that the Tri-Cities, Southwest Virginia, um, they made the decision at that point that they wanted to take control and ownership of their healthcare future. And so we're not just trying to become a better hospital system, we're actually trying to become a health improvement organization. You might ask, why, why are we focused on things like child literacy? Why is, why is a merged system, are we gonna make make it a priority to make sure that every child can read at the fourth grade level by the time they get to the fourth grade. Why would a hospital system care about that? Well, we know that if a child can read at the fourth grade level by the fourth grade, the statistics show that by the time they graduate high school, because they will, the statistics show they're more likely to graduate, but they graduate college or career ready. We know that if you graduate from high school, college or career ready, that you're then prepared to get a job. We know if you have a job, you're able to earn an income that can sustain you and your family, and therefore you turn less to drugs, and you, you, you have the opportunity to make a healthier life for you and your next generation of family. And that's what's, the, the, the correlation between reading comprehension at the third and fourth grade level, to graduation, to jobs, to good health, they all go together. Well, that's why it's out of the box for a hospital system today. We don't get paid for that, but we think it's so relevant and important that we've made it a priority. And, and I give the boards of Mountain States and Wellmont enormous credit for saying, okay, we're gonna look past the history and we're gonna look forward towards the future about what we can be as a region. And it's high risk, it's difficult, it's not easy, but it's worth it if we do it right. And so, you know, that's what we are, that's what Mountain States is. Certainly during my tenure, I think we're gonna try very hard to challenge ourselves to be something better for this region than just a collection of hospitals. And so we're proud of that. Let me, let, me, let me do what I'm here to do, and that is I want to introduce a guy that um, is really hard to introduce because there's really no words um, that, that can really uh, help you grasp the enormity of what uh, General Gary Harrell has done in his career. I had a chance to spend a little bit of time with him immediately before um, before this meeting, just to, to get to know him a little bit better, um, let me tell you he's a, he was the, he retired in 2009 he, as a major general, the deputy commanding general of the United States Army Special Operations Command. That's a big deal. Um, let me tell you about his journey to getting to that place in his career and a couple of stories about him. In 1973, he was originally commissioned as a second lieutenant. Upon graduating from East Tennessee State University, where he was active in the Army ROTC program. His initial assignment was to the 2nd Battalion, 508th Infantry, 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, where he served as a rifle platoon leader. Now going from rifle platoon leader to where he retired from and what he's doing today is an amazing journey. In 1989, he helped rescue U.S. hostage Kurt Muse from a Panamanian jail. Let me tell you a little about that. The rescue of Kurt Muse was the first time we rescued from behind enemy lines from where, that was being protected by hostile forces, first time we rescued a hostage. It was the first successful hostage rescue in our history. Um, last year, General Harrell had a chance to meet Mr. Muse's wife who, as I understand it, gave him a big old hug and wouldn't let go. <laughs> and uh, over the years, uh, Mr. Muse and the General have kept in touch, and I think every year he gets a thank you from Kurt for, for saving his life. Um, he served in the Delta Force for 15 years, ended up commanding it for two years, from 1998 through 2000. Uh, in 1991, he searched for mobile Iraqi Scud missile launchers in the first Persian Gulf War. He was a commander, and this is really, you've probably seen this movie or read the book. He was a commander during the 1993 Battle of Mogadishu, which was immortalized in the book and the movie Black Hawk Down. And he led perhaps the largest special operations force into combat in U.S. history in Iraq. And I mentioned in 1998, he took command of Delta Force, which is officially known as the First Special Forces Operational Detachment. He assumed command of the Special Operations Command Central in 2002. 
I hope I'm saying all this right, by the way, and I know he'll correct me if I don't. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, General Harrell commanded 50,000 personnel, which was the largest special operations force assembled since World War II. Um, a little about that, there was a, a story about that. Iraqi Freedom was the first time that the British special forces were ever commanded by a non-British leader. They weren't happy about this. Um, so they expressed some concerns the way perhaps a special forces team would express concerns. I can't explain that. I've never been in the room for something like that, but I imagine it's pretty challenging. Um, but they, they expressed concerns about being commanded by a non-British um, non leader. Um, General Frank, Tommy Frank, was the commander of um, the United States forces, and he said, you know, Folks, we sure are glad you want to be a part of this. He looked at uh, General Harrell and said, General, what do you think about this? I won't use the explicative that General Harrell used, but let's just say he disagreed with the, uh, the British leaders. And General uh, Frank uh, looked at the British leaders and said, we're glad you want to be a part of this. Uh, if you want to be a part of it, um, you're, you're welcome to be a part of it under the command of General Harrell. Otherwise, you're welcome to watch from the sidelines as we go and do what we do. And of course, uh, as history is written, General Harrell ended up commanding the British, fo British forces, and it was the first time their special forces had been, had been commanded by a non-British leader. In 2005, he was made the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations Commander, Deployable Joint, Board, Joint Task Force, NATO Response Force in the Netherlands. In his 35-year career in the military, General Harrell's awards and decorations include, among other things, I'm not going to list them all, Defense Superior Service Medal, the Bronze Star Medal with V device and two oak leaf clusters, Purple Heart. There's a great story. I say great story. There's a lot of stories behind those who have served and have received a Purple Heart. And uh, that means they put their lives clearly in harm's way in order to serve us. Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal with Oak Leaf Clusters, the Air Medal, Army Commendation Medal with two Oak Leaf Clusters, the Joint Service Achievement Medal, as well as numerous other service medals. He also earned the Combat Infantryman Badge, Master Parachutist Badge, Master Military Freefall Parachutist Badge, Pathfinder Badge, Scuba Diver, scuba diver Badge, Special Forces Tab, and Ranger Tab. This guy's a big deal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, woo, this is amazing. I feel honored just to be able to introduce him. Today, the retired Major General reti re resides right here in, in Johnson City with his family. He's currently serving as a Senior Vice President of Special Operations Programs for Cubic Defense Applications, and he's active on behalf of ETSU serving on various boards, and he's been inducted into the ETSU College of Business and Technology Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, I, I started to ask him what he does for uh, Cubic, and then I realized if he told me, I'd probably end up being shot, so I didn't ask. <laughs> but um, Commander, or General, we're, we're just so privileged to have you here today, and we're anxious to hear from you. So with no further ado, by the way, I could go on for an hour. Uh, please welcome Major General uh, Gary Harrell. Thanks uh, very much, Alan, for those uh, kind words and uh, all those embellishments you added to it. Um, I appreciate that very much. I, uh, I'm very uh, humbled to be asked to be here to uh, talk to you all about leadership. Um, I'm not real sure I know exactly what leadership is, but I know it to define it, but I know it when I see it. And uh, I. Uh, I grew up on a small farm about five miles from here in East Tennessee. I would not have been able to go to college had it not been for an ROTC scholarship. Now I got it because they made an announcement that you didn't have to go to uh, the fifth period class if you went to Mr. Sloniker's homeroom. You could hear somebody talk about ROTC. I wasn't sure what ROTC was at the time, but I knew it wasn't Mrs. Reed's algebra class. <laughs> so guess where I went. Um, I, uh, I think that um, leadership is uh, 
very much influenced by your background, where you come from, and I also think it's situational at times. Some people that you can think of that have been great leaders in the past might not do so well today, and vice versa. You know, one guy that comes to mind immediately is General George S. Patton, great leader, but he would have a hard time in today's military. Um, some of the controversial things he did would get him fired today. Um, so it's very situational. But I do think that sports and teamwork is very, very important to leadership. And so I'm very thankful that I got a chance to come here to uh, ETSU and play football. Uh, John Robert Bell was the head coach. Uh, some of you may remember those days. Some of you will not. Uh, but it was a great opportunity. And uh, I remember when the discussions were going on about doing away with the football team, I was one of the ones that said, please don't do that. And I was deployed a lot. I was gone, so I couldn't really, uh, couldn't really be here for a lot of meetings. But one of the things I said was, look, I would never have been able to go to UT and walk onto the football team. But because ETSU had a football team, I was able to play here. And I got all the great benefits from that. Um, and so I think the sports influence on, on leadership is enormous. I can't say enough about it. Very, very important. Um, I'd like to talk to you for about 20 minutes, and then what I'd like to do is take your questions, because really, I'm more interested in what you want to talk about than I am about the leadership that I'm going to talk about. Um, I said it's hard to define sometimes, and it means different things to different people. Uh, in the transformation leadership model, Leaders set directions, help themselves and others to do the right thing to move forward. They create an inspiring vision, then motivate and inspire others to reach that vision. That's one of the definitions I pulled up when I was getting ready to do the speech. Another definition is it's a process of social influence in which one person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. Those are both good, good uh, definitions. I think the importance of the vision the motivation and the inspiration to reach that vision is uh, very, very important that, uh, that was mentioned in the earlier definition. Another uh, definition that I've uh, laughed about a lot is uh, the expression lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. I think that's pretty doggone important, but uh, it is uh, sort of comedic. And then uh, a local, a local person with some small notoriety, David Crockett, he expressed it this way, be sure you're right, then go ahead. I've used that one a lot too. <laughs> and uh, I think what he meant is do your homework, make sure you know where you're headed, and then once you figure out that that's where you're gonna go, get on with it and make it happen. Um, there is a difference, I think, between management and uh, leadership. And in no way am I disparaging managers. Don't take it that way, please. But uh, I looked at a definition from Peter Drucker. It says, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Having said that, there are a lot of managers who are good leaders, and there are a lot of leaders who are good managers. They kind of go hand in hand. But they are a little bit different. If you also look in the, uh, in the uh, encyclopedia or if you look online, you'll see that there are recognized seven different styles of leadership. You're going to like this. Engaging, autocratic, democratic, free reign, narcissistic, toxic, and task oriented. And I want to tell you, I've known more than a few narcissistic and toxic leaders in, uh, in my career in the military. I think it's interesting though that, uh, you know, folks talk about the fact there's all these different styles of leadership. And uh, I'm also here to tell you there are more than one kind of follower. I break it down like this. There are two types of followers in the world. There are some that respond to a pat on the back, and there are some that respond to a kick in the butt. Your job as a leader is to figure out which kind you have. And oh, by the way, it's not a generic terminology. You've got them all mixed out throughout, throughout whoever your, uh, your followers are. But I will tell you, I, uh, I'm a, politically, I'm a little bit to the right of Attila the Hun. And uh, leadership from behind is called following. It's not leadership. 
And uh, my wife made me promise that uh, that would be about the limit of my uh, political comments today. But uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I think that that uh, leadership, like I said, can be uh, can be situational. Think of the difference between being leader of a college or a university, being leader of a football team on a football field or any sport. Um, and you'll hear me talk about football a lot, but uh, I'm an equal opportunity employer when it comes to sports. I think teamwork's great no matter how you get it. Um, or if you were a leader in a, and you were in a theater and you had a fire in a the theater, think about the difference in the two leadership styles that you'd see between, say, Dr. Nolan and somebody who was standing up uh, trying to get people out of a theater when the theater was on fire. Uh, some of the tactics and techniques you would use when the theater was on fire probably would not work at board meetings and, uh, and uh, gatherings at the college. It's not that either one's wrong. I don't mean it that way, but it is situational. It is different. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Or how about if you were the leader of a political party or if you were leading a nation? Um, must be a huge headache to be the president of the United States. Um, I got a small taste of it when I uh, commanded Delta. And uh, let's just say the folks in Delta are all high-speed performers. And uh, they're all very smart, and they all know what the right answer is. And uh, being the commander is kind of like herding cats. You kind of got to just get them all going in the right direction. But I used to tell my uh, Sergeant Major, I said, you know, Tom, if, um, if I ever make a decision and everybody here goes along, along with it, remind me that that was the wrong decision because if we got everybody to agree to it, uh, we were going the wrong way. I, uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a big fan of yes men. I'd like to talk about a uh, couple of situations in leadership that I'm familiar with. One of them's historic, a couple of them uh, I was there. If, uh, if you look in the dictionary under the term molon labe, and I'm probably butchering the Greek pronunciation, um, you will find that uh, in 480 BC, there was a place called Thermopylae. Their term, and it's called the Hot Gates, in the, if you translate it roughly to English. But uh, a guy named Leonidas, who was the king of Sparta, had 300 of his men and several hundred other um, Grecians defending their country against King Xerxes, the Persian, who was coming in with about 600,000 folks. Now you do the math, it is a little bit lopsided in the odds. But there were, um, the, the uh, Greeks were trying to delay the Persians until their families got away. That's all they were doing. And uh, Leonidas very cleverly picked out a really narrow pass and said, okay, this is where we're gonna dig in. My term, not his. Um, so, they defended this pass. And when you're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, even if you're heavily outnumbered, if those large numbers can only send a few people, a few number of people through that pass, you kind of got them at a standstill. And Leonidas and his troops fought them for three days. And uh, that gave their family time to get away, and it also gave the rest of the Greeks time to get ready for some follow-on battles. And at the end of three days, Xerxes sent a messenger to, uh, to Leonidas, and he said, you all have fought well. Your families have gotten away now. I know what you're doing. And uh, if you lay down your spears, you can walk away. Leonidas said, molan labe, which means come and take them. And they fought for a while longer. Uh, the, the Greeks would have held them, except for the fact a traitor told the Persians about a way to get around behind the Greeks. Okay, now the Greeks are facing an overwhelming force from both directions. They were wiped out to a man. But a few months later, because of the, the uh, Greeks had had chance to put their navy together better, uh, they met the uh, Persians in a place called Salamis and defeated them with a naval defeat. And then a few months later, they defeated their army again on the ground, and then they defeated their navy again. The bottom line is Xerxes and his men in their sacrifice not only allowed their families to escape and live, they also allowed their governments to prepare time to meet this Persian uh, overwhelming force. 
and Xerxes lost. When, uh, when we were getting ready to go to war at Soxent, uh, we didn't really have a, uh, a um, motto. And so I thought, gee, Molan Labe sounds like a good one. So if you look up Soxent today, if you look up Molan Labe, you'll see it's a motto of uh, Special Operations Command Central. I think it's very appropriate. Of course, I was the guy that picked it, so I would think that. <laughs> when uh, we were involved in operations in uh, Mogadishu and Somalia in October of 93, we uh, were chasing a guy named Muhammad Farah Adid. He was the warlord that was causing a lot of problems over there. The President of the United States sent a small force over to, uh, to try to take care of the situation. And I was the ground force commander for everybody on the ground. And uh, one morning on the, the 3rd of October, I found myself at about 3 o'clock in the morning with two helicopters shot down, numerous people wounded or killed, and um, had to try to figure out how to get them out. And uh, that was a long night because while we're, uh, while we're circling around overhead, we're also being shot at. And uh, every time you heard an RPG go off, you counted 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, boom. Okay, that one missed. And then we uh, went on through the night like that. It was a long night, but um, there were about 100 and some Americans on the ground. They were facing somewhere around 20,000 Somalis. And uh, you can find all kinds of different numbers in the book, um, but I will tell you that those numbers are, uh, are pretty good. We, uh, we took on 10,000 Somalis and we killed the better part of two to 5,000 of them. And we won the battle that night you could have walked across Mogadishu the next day carrying gold bullion in your hands, and uh, you would have not been molested. We lost 19 uh, killed and 73 wounded. And uh, the, uh, I want to mention some names here because every time I talk, I bring these guys up. Earl Fillmore, Gary Gordon, Grizz Martin, Randy Shugart, and Dan Bush, and Matt Ryerson. Six guys. They were my guys. Um, Randy and uh, uh, Gary were awarded the Medal of Honor. They were in a helicopter orbiting around overhead. They were listening to and saw what was going on. And when the second chopper went down, they, uh, they asked to be put in on it. They probably lived about 20 minutes, ran out of bullets. Um, and there wasn't anything else we could do about them. And uh, I've thought about this a lot. And uh, if you could ask Gary and Randy, hey, would you like to go back and do this over and get to come back and live with your families and all that, they'd say yes. And if you offered them the opportunity, which I know you can't do, they would refuse it because they said, we're doing our jobs. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And they'd ask to be put back in again. Um, I also want to uh, talk about the fact that the situational leadership came to play in that battle that long night. I had a, uh, one of my subordinate officers, <clears throat> he, uh, his name was, I'll call him Bill, and uh, Bill had been doing okay. He wasn't particularly outstanding, he was just kind of getting the job done, and I didn't know whether or not he was going to make it. That night, Bill was on one of the reserve choppers, and uh, I made a decision to put him in on the ground with about five guys. and. Uh, when I put him in on the ground, I'm talking to him on the radio, and in the middle of this conversation, I literally did this, because the calm guy who's in charge of the situation on the ground that I'm talking to on the radio ain't the Bill I'm used to talking to. But I, I tell you that story to illustrate the fact that this guy who'd kind of been doing okay in, in, in peacetime was a superstar when it came into commanding in a combat operation. And it was not a nice situation I put him down there into. But he did an outstanding job. Um, I, I will also tell you that in my opinion, uh, the United States snatched defeat from the jaws of victory that night. Because uh, we won the battle in Mogadishu that night. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how you want to count it. 
I was there, I saw what was going on. But some political decisions were made that went the other way, and that's, that's the way the ball bounces too. That's the way our government works. And uh, we, uh, we wound up with a uh, less than victorious situation. But the guys who were on the ground that night won that battle. And, and I gotta tell you, in the middle of that night, if you want to talk about leadership and some of the problems you have with leadership, try answering this question. I got a commander on the ground. One of his troops is bleeding out. He's got a femoral wound, and you get about five to ten minutes with that one. And uh, he says, boss, if you can't get a helicopter in here, Jones is going to die. Can't put a helicopter in. That ground fire is too, too tough. And uh, so, when you're faced with situations like that, um, I would submit to you that you need a good, good moral basis for your leadership because you're, you're balancing one guy's life against 10, 15, 20. Having another helicopter shot down would have been disastrous to us. I've also read the criticisms that said we didn't have a contingency plan. Yeah, well, okay, everybody can take their shots. We did have several contingency plans. Two of them worked, or uh, one of them worked, two of them didn't. But we had gone through, we had rehearsed exactly what we do if a helicopter went down like that. We went through that, and about the time we were getting ready to pull those guys out, and oh, by the way, we had uh, gone that night after uh, 12 or so of Mohammed Farah Deed's lieutenants. We had 20 in the truck when the first helicopter went down. And oh, by the way, we brought them back. But uh, it was... Uh, um, a problematic uh, decision-making uh, uh, deal that I had to put up with because you're trying to figure out how to get everybody in there. And a lot of times when I, uh, I hear pl operations plans today being briefed, one of the first things I'd say was, okay, you got a good plan for getting in, but what's your plan for getting out? You better have more contingencies for getting out than you had for going in. Um, the other situation that I'll talk about that uh, for leadership was on the USS Cole. Some of you may remember that and some of you not, but on 12 October 2000, uh, frigate, US Navy frigate, uh, the USS Cole, sailed into Aden Harbor and tied up at the pier. Um, and the, uh, as they, they tied up there, normally when a Navy ship comes in, all these small boats come around and they're doing everything from selling fresh food to resupply to you name it. And uh, Kirk Lippold was the Navy captain that was in charge of that ship. And as, as I got involved in it, I will tell you that Kirk and his people did a great job that night because one of the boats was, had been hollowed out and was loaded with explosives. And when a guy got it close to the ship, he cranked off that charge and blew a huge hole in the hull. And uh, it killed 17 and he had 39 wounded in action. Because that charge was so close to the keel. I'm not a Navy guy, I'm not a sailor. But Kirk told me that if he'd have been about that much further, the ship would have gone down because he would have broken the keel. And when that happens, you're done. Kirk and his guys fought the ship. And what I mean by that is, that ship is a machine. And they manned it and made it do everything it was supposed to do. And uh, they took care of their wounded and uh, they they survived that long night. I was in, uh, I'd arrived in Riyadh and um, I called General Franks. I was responsible for all the security in the Middle East at that time. I talked to uh, General Franks and I said, hey boss, I'm in Riyadh, what do you want me to do? Um, he said, get your ass to Aden. And I said, okay, what do you want me to do when I get there? He said, hell, I don't know. That's what I pay you to do. I tell you that story to tell you what a great leader I thought Franks was. And uh, he had enough trust in, uh, in me to, uh, to just tell me to get down there and fix the situation. I did. Um, I, I, uh, I firmly believe to this day that Lippold, there's no way he could have done anything different to, to prepare for that situation he found himself in. Of course, in the Navy, if you lose a ship, you're done. In the Navy, if your ship comes up, if your submarine comes up under a friendly ship and uh, damages the submarine or the ship, you're done. And if your ship gets blown up in Aden Harbor, you're done. And Kirk, that was the end of his career. I think he's an outstanding officer and, and I have nothing but admiration 
for he and the crew that manned that ship and did what they needed to do to keep it from uh, sinking. And I was in Aden Harbor when uh, the, I'll call it hastily repaired, USS Cole flew out of the harbor. They had their largest battle flag flying and there wasn't a dry eye on the dock and they were playing the national anthem as they sailed out. That's leadership. Um, there, uh, one more situation I'll talk about I was involved in. There was, during the Iraq War, um, I was responsible, or my command, better said, was responsible for keeping the uh, Iraqi forces up in the northern part of the country from coming down and interfering with the, uh, the, um, the U.S., for the coalition forces who were invading from the south. And one day we were having a morning update and uh, my intel officer turned to me and he goes, hey boss, this uh, division's starting to move south. And I said, tell that ODA to move over and stop them. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, Tom, who's a really good intel officer and smart guy, he goes, boss, that division's about 20,000 people or so, and that ODA is 12 men. You know that, don't you? And I said, yeah, sure I do. But that ODA's got every aircraft sortie from the USS George Washington on call. Tell them to get the jets in the air and stop the division. I tell you that story because that was part of the coalition planning that went into those operations. And uh, you better believe that that division did not move south. I talked to some of the guys on the ODA and they said it was a little bit uh, touch and go for a while, but uh, they were able to keep them out. And you know, if you talk to military folks, if somebody's been in the Marine Corps or somebody in the Army, whatever, we will give each other a hard time uh, in peacetime. But when it comes time that uh, shots are being fired, you want everybody around that you can get to, uh, to help you do your job. And uh, you're very happy, well, I was very happy, and the guys on the ground were very happy to have all those aircraft uh, up over their heads. And they, they did, they did a great job, and they literally put it on the deck for the guys on the ground. And uh, that happened with the air component and the naval component as well during uh, those operations. I. Um, I note, uh, I, or sometimes I uh, hear folks talk about General Franks and uh, they go, well, you know, Franks didn't have a good plan. He was this, he was that. Hey, listen, Franks had about 11 contingency plans, um, a bunch of them. And uh, we had rehearsed all of them. Uh, all of them didn't work. One of the big mistakes that we made was getting rid of the uh, elements of the Iraqi army. We should not have done that. Not that they were good guys or anything, but they brought stability to the situation. We're still suffering from that, in my opinion. But um, I'll, I'll, I also never miss a chance to talk about WMD, because if you listen to the news, you are told that there was no WMD in Iraq. President Bush lied, we died. I've heard all that. Well, if you think there was no WMD in Iraq, go home and look up Sarin. S-A-R-I-N. It's a nerve agent developed by the Germans in 1939. It is one of the most potent um, weapons of mass destruction that anybody knows about. If we were in this room and I had a very small vial and I took the vial and opened it and closed it like that, everybody in here would be dead. Everybody downwind from this building for a couple of miles would be dead. That's how potent this stuff is. Sarin gas was used by Saddam Hussein, and it was also used by, uh, by him when he, when he uh, attacked the Kurds with sarin and mustard gas, which is another terrible weapon. So I don't know why some people say there was no WMD. I, I, I can't explain that. I can only tell you what we found. And uh, there was WMD in Iraq. We found uh, stockpiles of sarin. Uh, we found rockets that exceeded the mandated uh, um, range of mandated by the UN, which means they went, but they were more powerful than uh, what the UN allowed them to have. So uh, I don't know why some of those decisions are being made. I can only tell you what me and my guys saw, and uh, they were experimenting with a lot of different things too. And, um, if you remember, those of you that were around and paying attention to the news then, they found these huge mobile trailers. Those mobile trailers were made to produce weaponized anthrax. 
You take a chemical weapon, that's bad, but if you take something that's biological, like a disease, and you weaponize it, it's really bad. It, it's, it's a twofer. Not only does the blast and everything kill the people around it, but then the people that survive that initial part of it start, they're contagious, so they start spreading it all over the country. It's a terrible weapon system to, uh, to use. And the sarin was um, mandated a, a, a WMD by a UN Resolution 687. So there was WMD there. And I also think that uh, those weapons trailers, and I believe we found three of them, were used to produce weaponized anthrax. Some of the media came back and said, you know, we, we went to those trailers and we couldn't find a trace of uh, weaponized anthrax in those trailers. And so we, we think they were probably used to produce hydrogen and blow up balloons for fairs and <laughs> county fairs and other things like that. And my, my answer to that is, okay, if you're uh, Joe Haji and you come in on Monday, you make a run of sarin gas, you, you, cl you shut it off, and you go home for the weekend and you come back the next Monday, what happens if you walk in and you didn't completely clean out that system? You're exposed to it. You're dead. So, no kidding. They, uh, they have a system to, uh, to clean out that stuff. Again, I, uh, I can't tell you why some of, the, um, some of the decisions that have been made and some of the, the uh, comments, but I did, I did note with interest that uh, they're about uh, four weeks ago, a month ago, there was a report on the news that they were worried because ISIS had found weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and they were they had access to them. So if there were none there, I'm not sure what they were worried about. But that's um, <laughs> that's kind of for somebody else to answer. But G General Tommy Franks was a great commander, and he uh, he was a great leader during the war. I admire him very very much. I still get to see him every great once in a while, but uh, he was a good leader. I, uh, I think that uh, I would like to see a, a system developed in the United States that uh, provided us three things. And normally I say if I was king for a day, this is what we do in the U.S., but uh, I'm not going to be king for a day. But I think it would be very important for every, if you could make it, and I know you can't, but everybody that can in the United States ought to, as they're growing up, they should be part of a sports team. I don't care what it is, football, basketball, whatever. But that teamwork that you learn from playing sports is very, very important to you for the rest of your life. Now, I think education's great. Um, I'm a big proponent of it, and I think it would help us out with a lot of problems. But education's not your, your end goal for going to college, I think. I think the end goal for going to college is to be prepared to live the rest of your life as well as you can. And certainly education is a large part of that. Please don't take what I said the wrong way. I am not against education. But I think teamwork is an equal part of your development and learning teamwork. And so if you're on a team and uh, you don't understand that the three most important things about that is teamwork, second most important thing is teamwork, and the third most important thing about it is teamwork. If you don't understand that, and you didn't get it on the, on the playing field, you might have a hard time picking up on it the rest of your life. I think that uh, everyone growing up should have to work in a job serving the public, especially if you're working on a commission. And I say that because when I was in high school, I got a job at Hannah's Men's Clothing Store, which used to be on Main Street in Johnson City. And uh, we, we got a salary, but we mostly worked on commission. And I learned uh, very quickly that uh, if you judge people by the, what they look like when they come in, you, uh, you might regret it. Because the old farmer in a pair of coveralls that's coming in, wanting to buy a new Kuppenheimer suit, may have a wad of bills in his, in his uh, pocket about that thick. And the guy coming in in the three-piece suit to buy a new tie, he may not have that. So you have to treat everybody equal, and you have to make sure that you're uh, providing a service to everyone. 
That, by the way, is a true story. I, uh, I did meet the, the farmer in the coveralls, and fortunately, I, uh, I was uh, going to him to, uh, to see if I could help him with something. And the Kuppenheimer suit was the most expensive suit we had in the store. Obviously, we wanted to sell as many of those as we could. And he came in, pulled out a wad of bills, and said, I want me one of them Kuppenheimer suits. And I made sure he got one. <laughs> The last thing I'd be a big proponent for is uh, working 12 to 24 months, months somewhere Oconus. In the military, we talk about the continental United States, Conus, and if you're not in the continental United States, you are Oconus, out of Conus. And uh, I would propose that everybody have to sign up for some kind of service, Oconus, or outside the United States. Why? Because when you go to some of these other countries, you find out very quickly we've got things really good here in the States. Try being hungry and going and finding a McDonald's hamburger in a village, tribal village in Afghanistan, Jordan, different places. And, and I'm not knocking those countries. I'm just saying they don't have that capability. Try forgetting to update your prescription and uh, waking up and needing it at 1 o'clock in the morning and going to a drugstore. Good luck. You're not going to find anything. Um, and so I think if, if uh, more folks had a chance to experience life Oconus outside the United States, uh, we would have a lot less people that are unhappy with what's going on in the United States. Are we perfect? No. But we've got a lot of things going for us. So to sum up, if uh, my recipe for successful leadership would be something like this. Surround yourself with the most capable team you can find. I think that's really a mark of a good leader. You want to have good, smart people around you who are experts in their field of endeavor. Give them broad right and left limits. And this is probably the most important part. Get the hell out of the way and let them work. <laughs> Don't be calling them every 10 minutes and go, are we there yet? Have we got it? Are we done? That's not the way it works. Now, I think vision and strategy are a key to success. Okay, this is my second one. I'm not sure what our strategy is in the world right now, and, but it ain't there. We're suffering from a lack of strategy. Um, I'll also tell you that uh, I think uh, trust is a two-way street. It goes up and it comes down. And if you violate it either way, you're not being a good leader. <laughs> and then final thought is, as a leader, you don't always have to be the biggest, baddest, first guy at the, on the race, lifting the most weights in the gym, all that stuff. You don't have to be first at everything that your organization or your unit does but you better not be last. It's okay to be in the middle. You don't have to beat everybody that, that works for you, but don't be last, because that don't work too good. You've got to set the example. That's what I, uh, I think successful leadership would, uh, would look like if I was writing it. Um, I'd like to uh, take your questions. I think we've got just a few more minutes. Uh, I don't know where, Dick, how much longer do we, do we have? About five more minutes. Okay, you can take ten. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you don't have a yeah, yeah. Um, anybody got any questions or anything you want to ask me about? Yes, ma'am. I saw your hand go up first in the back. First, I want to thank you for your service. Very much. Uh, I can't let this opportunity go by without asking you to correct the Um, I, I, I thought that might be the first question I got. Um, ISIS is a big problem. We have not dealt with it adequately heretofore. And if you think that ISIS is not in the United States right now plotting attacks, I would submit to you you're naive. All those people that have come across the border are not just from Mexico. 
and uh, it's only a matter of time. As a matter of fact, we've already had terrorist attack attacks in the United States. And I'm sorry, if you want to call it workplace violence, you can, but if somebody with a hatchet's running at me yelling Allah Akbar, I think that's a terrorist attack. We've had several of those. We've had people decapitated in the United States, which is something else that, that ISIS likes to do very well. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not good to second guess folks, but uh, when ISIS was moving east out of Syria, sure would have been a good target for B-52s. We missed that opportunity. It's a lot harder dealing with people when they're in amongst the, uh, the people that live there. So I, uh, I hope I'm wrong. Um, I'm concerned about where we are with ISIS. They are not a JV team. They're very successful. If you could go to some of the countries where these people live, you would understand why that the beheading is a successful recruiting tool, because that's showing power. And they come from, boy, don't take this the wrong way, but they come from nothing. So when you have nothing and you see somebody demonstrating power like that, great, great recruiting tool. And, uh, you know, I think, um, King Abdullah had a great response when they burned his pilot. He walked out of the room, flew back to Jordan, and uh, they, they put airstrikes in the air that day. That's the kind of response you need to give to people like this. And, uh, okay, this is three. Um, when I was on active duty, uh, it used to be fairly popular to say things, well, you know, we can't kill enough of these guys to, uh, to make a difference. And this is going to sound kind of hard, but I'm now of the attitude of, well, you know, we haven't tried that, so maybe that ought to be another option. <laughs> Might work. What we're doing is not working. And, you know, you've heard the, uh, the talk about um, possible attacks over the 4th of July. If I was them, I'd hit us then. Uh, will that happen? I don't know. And we've got a lot of people working really hard. Don't, 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 take, don't take my comments wrong because there, there are a lot of people that are working hard. And there have been so many attacks thwarted that you don't know about. It's not even funny. But um, we, we need to do a little bit more, I think. And uh, it would be great to have a strategy for dealing with ISIS. Um, and it, you need to get a hold of your congressman and your senator and ask him what the heck he's doing about that. Because it's a problem. And get out and vote in this next election. Make yourself smart first and then vote. Yes, sir. Uh, General, there seems to be a, a large number of flag level officers that come out of this area for the population base. What do you think caused that to occur, that kind of leadership to come out of a smaller population? <laughs> Good old East Tennessee rednecks. <laughs> Um, you know, ETSU has had one of the most successful um, programs around. And I think we're number three or four, Dr. Nolan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's way up there in the, in the number of flag officers that have come out of the ETSU ROTC program. Now I can tell you why it was, I think it was uh, very beneficial to me because we, at that time, we had a bunch of uh, really outstanding officers here. Most of them had just come back from Vietnam tours. And uh, you know, it kind of, it's hard to ignore an instructor when he says, look, if you don't do this this way, you will wind up dead. Powerful educational um, experience. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I'm not saying that to be funny. I, I really do mean that's what they were telling us. And so we had just a cadre of really outstanding, experienced uh, military folks who taught us the things that we should know to be successful. I think that's a large part of it. And I, I, uh, I give kudos to the ROTC department here. Um, I think it's, it's done a great job and it's probably, 
gee, I don't know where the ranking really is, uh, but it's, it's up at the top. It's very, very good program. And that's where I give credit for the number of flag officers that have come out of it. Um, even if Fred McCorkle was here, I wouldn't talk bad about the Marines, too. But we've had a lot of flag officers. Yes, sir. How do you balance um, uh, mission first and people first? There is no balance. It's mission first. But good leaders figure out a way to take care of their troops as well. And I, I'm not being flippant. When you go to do a mission, sometimes you lose people. You heard me talk about that today. It, there is no guarantee that it's going, everybody's going to be successfully coming home. Um, but the most important thing you have to accomplish is the mission. So certainly I believe that you've got to take care of your people. And um, I think that's very, very important. But the number one objective is accomplishing the mission. Um, that's just the way it has to be. And I'm certainly not advocating you know uh, doing something that puts people at risk unnecessarily but combat operations are risky and everything doesn't always go uh, like you planned you better have several contingency plans to deal with it and if you don't uh, you hadn't been a good leader but um, I do think that in every other opportunity, you have to make sure you take care of your people. Another technique that works very, very well is when you've got time, explain to them why you're doing what you're doing and what your decisions were. Because if they're used to you doing a good job taking care of them and they understand your thought process and what you're doing, then when it comes time that you can't explain everything to them and you've got to give them a mission and say go, they go, okay, well, the boss has been right before. He's been telling us what's going on. So, okay, we'll trust him on this one and we'll go do it. Um, that sounds a bit trite, but it's not. It's very, very important. And like I said, trust is a two-way street. So while I say there is no balance, taking care of your people is uh, certainly very, very important, whether you're in the military, civilian world, whatever. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd, uh, thank you. God bless you and God bless the United States of America.